we're uh, very lucky to have Seymour Hersh with us uh, to discuss some of the work he's done. Uh, Thank and you. Thank you. Which we're looking forward to hearing. This evening, there'll be a much uh, more focused talk on current serious events involving prison, NSA, uh, and the consequences for journalism uh, that are implicit in these extraordinary events. Um, but those of you, uh, I think there's almost nobody here who doesn't know Seymour Hersh's background and what he's done uh, from uh, the My Lai revolutions in the, in the war in Vietnam to Abu Ghraib, the Pulitzer Prize, uh, and all the rest of it. Um, I would just suggest I want to give him over. He's got a lot to say, so I want to pass him over to you as quickly as possible. But just to say, if you want any more detail about it, there's plenty available immediately with, from us in the hall and from the websites and all the rest. Uh, his record is quite extraordinary, but I won't, uh, you'll know that once you read it. Okay. See more. All right. That's great. You actually did. Most of the time, it's, they start with, we, you don't, need, you don't need an introduction, then we get an introduction. That was good. You actually didn't, you, you, you didn't bite the bullet. Um, what do we have, about an hour and what, yeah. 10 minutes about or so? Um, we can, you know, if you ask me questions about, you know, what's really going on, we can talk about it, but it's all depressing. So it doesn't make that much difference. Nothing good is going on. And I have this view about journalism, this sort of um, heuristic view, uh, uh, the upbeat view of journalism that I was saying earlier that s the virtue we have is uh, we possibly offer hope because the world is clearly run by total nincompoops more and more than ever. And so we offer at least some way out for some people to get some rational, not that journalism is always wonderful, it's not, it has a lot of failings, uh, but at least we offer some way out for some integrity and good process. Uh, because um, the more, you know, I, we see how disillusioned um, many in Amer my country are very dis disillusioned about the government we have now you know, um, um, uh, not much change, but a lot of talk about it. And so we seem to be in the same hole, always, always wars, war seems to be the answer. And um, I, I knew friends, you know, growing up in, uh, I, I'm, I grew up in Chicago, but I've been in Washington for many years, since the 60s, my God, uh, long of tooth. And there are a lot of, there are still a lot of people in America, for example, believe in the Constitution, um, but the way it works is those who always advocate killing are the ones who get the, win the argument because those who argue, uh, you know, argue not to. Them, um, I have an old friend, I was just telling Gavin, I have an old friend, Dan Ellsberg, the one who did the Pentagon Papers that's so much in sort of in the news today because of the Snowden event, the whole notion of a whistleblower. Um, Ellsberg uh, once told me that he was a major planner inside the government, a very brilliant guy, and was sort of committed in the early days to the government. And when they were doing all the talk about planning for the escalation in Vietnam at one meeting with the president and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all of our, our honchos, they were talking about all the studies and all the plans did, and Dan asked, just for the record, he said, and he was the whiz kid, he was the RAN, RAN Corporation scholar, he'd done all the nuclear targeting because he was a, uh, uh, he was a boy genius in, in, uh, in, uh, in math and, um, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, political, political science and political theory, and also with the hard edge of realism. So he was the one who could say, we should put this many mega bombs on this bridge and that. He did that for the government way back. He asked at this point, has anybody ever done a study about how many lives the war will cost? And the answer was no and we usually describe the Vietnam War is usually described as we lost 58,000 dead and between one and two million Vietnamese were killed. I mean, as if the numbers are not interchangeable, or, you know, as if there's no distinction. We have the same phenomenon in Iraq. Uh, America's walked away from its disaster in Iraq. You, you Brits had a play. I assume some of you are Brits here. It's a rational assumption. Um, and assumptions are bad, always bad. Uh, but anyway, um, we walk away, and Iraq's now, of course, totally in a civil war, and of course, nobody wants to acknowledge it. It's a Sunni-Shia war. It's been going on for a year. And it's just embarrassing to talk about it, because it's just embarrassing for, for the nincompoops that run our government to face up to what they do and what they haven't done. Okay, we can, that'll, we'll, we can deal with all that stuff. But I'll tell you just a boy reporter story, because I think um, 
it's pretty amazing um, um, uh, the power we can have and what makes our profession sort of so just amazing. It's 69 and I'm 30 years old, uh, less than that maybe, and I'm, I've been around. I worked for the, um, I flunked out of law school, which is what maybe decided to be a general. I hated law school. Went to law school, University of Chicago. Um, went to college there, went to law school, hated it, worked around, did what kids did, you know, you know, recreational drugs and all that stuff that everybody does, I hope you should. No sense, no sense castigating something you haven't tried. <laughs> you know, it's just, you got to try it before you say it's no good. Anyway, um, and so I did all that stuff and went in the Army because I had to go, it was compulsory, got out, became a reporter, um, eventually found my way to the Associated Press and they assigned me uh, to cover the Pentagon and the Vietnam War and I became OJT and while for working for the AP in 65, 66 and 67 I began to be increasingly, the war was gone, it was incredible and the nice thing about American officers at the Pentagon there was a cafeteria you could sit down and you could talk about football, I mean American football with a, a colonel who just came back from the war and before long you become buddy buddy with him and um, they start telling you, all we're doing is killing people. You know, start getting a sense of how bad it is. And in a way, this thing that this was distinguished from what the politicians were telling us. And this was in the Johnson days. And this is a war that was begun by Jack Kennedy, people forget. He, he initiated it, Johnson continued it. And so, OJT, on the job training, I didn't like the war. Eventually it led to writing stories that got me reassigned from the Pentagon, from the AP, by the AP, from the Pentagon to Health and Human Services, so I resigned, which is what they wanted me to do. Became a freelance writer. There was a guy named Eugene McCarthy, who was an anti-war. He was a Benedictine from Minnesota, a very devout Catholic, very, very smart, and he decided he was going to challenge Lyndon Johnson um, for the presidency. Johnson's a sitting president. He's a Democratic senator from a small state, and what was his, and running an anti-war. Bobby Kennedy wouldn't run then. He was afraid then. He didn't want to take on. The Kennedys were always very careful. McCarthy, McCarthy's position was, and it's the most amazing sentence I'm going to tell you, it's a sentence you never hear. The war was immoral, he said. We were running an immoral war. Politicians never talk about morality because if they did, they'd be screwed to the wall because everything we're doing is so basically immoral. I mean, the spying is just a little part of it. It's just basically so much of what passes for warfare is so unnecessary and can be resolved by other means. And um, uh, nobody wants, you know, you have a problem, you have a terrorist problem, but you also have great social upheavals and there's other ways of attacking the social inequities, uh, which involve um, uh, not thinking that you have to drone them to death. Um, there's other ways of dealing with the problems. They're long term, but they're, they're not being done and they're, they're irrational. It's all irrational. So anyway, so I worked for McCarthy for a little while. He ran for president and Johnson quits. And then he's now he's no longer an anti-war campaign. He's now running for the presidency and I don't want to do that. So I quit and I go back to being a journalist and I'm a freelance journalist. I try to get a job. I've done a lot of good stories and uh, uh, as press secretary for a guy who came from nowhere to knock off a president, uh, uh, there was a, he ran against uh, in, in New Hampshire uh, Eugene McCarthy is a write-in candidate, got 41% of the vote, and Johnson got a little bit, a couple points more, and that was it. He resigned. Johnson quit three days later. It was over. If a write-in guy, Minnesota guy, preaching about the war being immoral can almost beat a sitting president among Democrats in a primary, the primaries, the, you can, you, Republicans can't vote in it, well, then it's over. Um, he had to quit. And so, by, so I go back, and I'm a freelance writer. Uh, Nixon comes in, and Nixon's big campaign was he had a secret plan to end the war. It turned out Nixon's, uh, uh, Richard Nixon won the election in 68, won over Hubert Humphrey. McCarthy didn't make it. Um, Nixon's plan to end the war really was he was going to win it. That was his plan. He was going to win it, so he was going to escalate it. We didn't know that. We thought he had a secret plan to end the war, but it involved expanding. So here we are, the usual typical madness going on. And in the fall of 69, I'm in the position, I'm still yipping and yamming, I'm a freelance writer, no newspaper would hire me, the Times and the Washington Post, even though I'd worked with all these reporters, nobody would hire me because I'd work for a politician. It's a lot different now, it goes, particularly here in this country, you go back and forth, but also in America. And so I'm out there sort of banging into the wind, writing stuff, and um, I'd done a book on chemical and biological warfare, I was doing another book about something about Pentagon waste and bored to death. 
And well, I mean, it was, you know, I had a contract and a freelance writer. You guys, many of you know what I'm talking about. You gotta eat. I don't know how you live in this town. It's so expensive. It's just brutal. I always am shocked. I'm just shocked by how expensive Lon London is. And um, that's, that's amazing. Anyway, so 69, I'm minding my business. I read a lot of stuff about the war. Kids are coming back, totally disaffected. I'm just reading this book that I, it's called Yellow Bird. It's by a guy who served in Iraq. It's won all sorts of prizes. It's just so brilliant about, he's just there and he's a kid from a farm. He gets into the war in Iraq and what they're doing is murdering civilians, just killing them. And he's losing his mind gradually. And he's, he writes beautifully about it. Uh, poetically about it, but anyway, it, it doesn't, it's the same old story. I mean, you know, kid goes to find out that the war isn't war, it's just mass murder. And maybe World War II is better, but I'm, I'm skeptical of everything these days. Anyway, I'm probably our last good war. Um, so, um, and I know there's been horrible crimes committed in the field and all sorts of stuff, and one day I get a call. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just run this story down. I'm nowhere, I'm making eight, 10,000 bucks a year as a freelancer. This is the days when you could buy four uh, gallons, gallons of gasoline for a dollar. And um, uh, I have a wife who's a social worker, we've got a little baby, and we're, we're not feeling it. We're having a good time. We can still go and eat tacos once a week or something, or whatever it is. And um, um, I get a call from a lawyer who was a lawyer involved in uh, army, uh, a army dissidents, guys in the army who went AWOL, who quit, who refused to fight, who went to Sweden. And he says, hey, uh, I knew his brother. And he said, uh, my brother Paul told me, uh, you know, I know what you do. I was then, I was against the war and being outspoken, but I was a nickel dimer as a freelancer. I'm at the, not at the New York Times and I'm not on you know, NBC or something like that. He said, there's been a terrible murder. There's a guy, some, some, uh, some guy has gone crazy and shot up a lot of people in Vietnam and it's a real big problem. I mean, really big. And for some reason, because I knew the history and I knew how often mass murders took place and weren't accounted for, uh, I believed it. So I started working this story. And so I just dropped whatever I was doing. And, I, and, I, and, and it just sounded like it was a wild goose chase. I was bored with my book. And so I started looking and I, being in the army, I knew that if somebody had been, and it was being prosecuted, the army, the difference was the army wasn't looking the other way. Um, the way it happens, well, you know, I, military justice is an old cliche, is the justice is military, music is the music, okay? So I knew that there was the, the notion that the army was actually prosecuting somebody for killing a lot of people was pretty amazing, if true. So I start looking, and the first thing I do is I go to the Pentagon, and we're, you know, uh, everybody jokes about the Third Reich and how they kept careful records of what they did. Well, we also keep careful records in the Pentagon. There's a judge advocate office, there's a legal office. I started going through every criminal case that had been filed uh, in Vietnam for the past year. And I went, I saw nothing that looked familiar. We're talking about days of just going through one file after another. And they were all centrally located in the Pentagon. There was a building, an office there. And it was all in, you know, this is before the days of computer. We're talking about looking at pieces of paper. Computers were there, but everything wasn't computerized then. And so I'm doing all this stuff, the, the normal stuff, and asking people and calling around and getting nowhere. And then, um, it, I, as I mentioned, I'd covered the Pentagon and I got to know guys. There was a colonel I knew, sort of a nice guy, and he was sent to Vietnam, and I would heard he got, he got two things happen. He got promoted to general, which is a big deal, and he also got wounded. And I hadn't, I hadn't seen him in a year and a half. I'm in the Pentagon, again, just going from one legal office, and if it wasn't legal, I went to the social welfare. I was going to every office where there might be some claims. I was looking through war crime, claims we, we made the civilians and maybe I could find a period when there were 50 or 70 claims in one or two days and that might be a way of getting into this. I didn't know how big or little the crime was, but I'm doing it. Uh, why I kept on doing it, I don't know, but I'm doing it because um, uh, um, I knew it happened. I, I knew this kind of stuff happened, or at least I sensed it. I didn't know it, but I sensed it. And so I'm doing this and why had I sensed it? Because I read. I read before I write. I was reading what kids were saying. I was reading local newspaper. I was reading the radical newspaper accounts. I was reading stuff. Can't get anywhere if you don't read before you write. I was reading hearings when sometimes some of the generals would say, well, we've had this problem and that problem, but not be specific or go into classified hearings. I knew there was a, and I knew from my context, there was a layer 
an ugly layer. You have no idea what's going on in Afghanistan. I could mention words to you about the kind of killing they do now. It's very specialized. Our guys are under special extreme forms of, of horrible killing because we're so, the few guys that are left know they're, they, they're gonna, they don't want to be the last one to die. And nobody wants to be the last one to die. So there's awful stuff going on. There always is in war. There always is. That's a given. People always do horrible, brutal things. Uh, Syria is an example. Both sides are doing the worst kind of stuff to each other right now. They have been for, it's escalated beyond all repair. Mass murder of infants and children and women, just head cutting. It's just unbelievable stuff going on on both sides. So, okay. So um, I'm in the Pentagon crapping around trying to figure out, you know, what office I can go to next to look for it. And I see this guy, this, uh, this officer, uh, he's still a colonel, he hadn't gotten his general, he was frocked, that meant he was going to become a general, he'd been nominated, but he hadn't gotten the actual, uh, the, the, the little star yet, he still wore the eagles, uh, whatever it is. And I see him walking the corridor limping, and I make fun of him, I grab him, I say hello, I haven't seen him in a year, and I'm, I was a nam, and I say something, I'm sure, I know what I said, I said, so you shot yourself in the foot to get out, huh? Right, well, ha ha ha. And so, and then he was talking, I said, so what are you doing now? You're back early, you didn't, you didn't do a full tour, and you're still, how'd you make general? What happened? I said, these are all, in that business, making general is what you talk about. It's like being promoted, being made editor, if anybody wants to be an editor. I hope none of you want to be editors. It's really bad, not things you want to do, because then editing means you're suffocating others. Um, and say, no, you can't write this. Um, sometimes they even say, you can't think this. So, I, mean, I had one at the New York Times, Abe Rosenthal used to say, do you really think this? And I'd say, do you want to know what I think? You really, you know, really want, you know, what bullshit goes on here? Anyway, so, um, uh, and I say, I, I joked with him, I said, what are you doing now? He said, well, I work for the chief of staff, General, a really awful guy named General Westmoreland, not awful, just somebody once said, he once publicly said, uh, the Vietnamese don't think about death the same way we do. It's, it's easier for them. He actually said that. He actually said that. It's easier for them. You know, they, they, they're more used to it. It's easier. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, Google it. Westmoreland. Um, it was a, a, anyway, and he said, I work for the chief of staff. Oh, my God. I said, so what's this about some big shoot-up, some big shoot-up in Vietnam? And I'll never forget what he did. He's limping, and he goes like this to his bad knee. He goes like this. He says, hey, Hirsch, that guy, Kelly, he didn't shoot anybody higher than that, he said. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing there. And I, I could have said, um, if I was a fool, what are you talking about? There's nothing. That's a great story. Instead, I said, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, that's what we do. We're not always very straightforward. I, always, I sometimes like to tell the story negatively about how you can't trust any reporter because we never tell you what you think. We never tell you what we're thinking. But uh, obviously I was going to say, so I had a name, Callie. And so I go and I go through the files again and sure enough there's a William L. Callie Jr. who's been prosecuted and, the, and, and, and uh, being, held for, uh, uh, being held for manslaughter. That's all it said. That's, there was a public release about it. The New York Times had a story the previous, about two months earlier, this big on a Saturday saying, Army said of William, a lieutenant, second lieutenant named Calvert being held at, at Fort Benning, no it wasn't Fort, it was some Fort, Fort Jackson in, um, in uh, South Carolina. You should know I went there. And so um, I've got a name and I call up Fort Jackson, just the public information office. I just wonder what they're telling that guy because I know that's, that's an office and I get some major and I say, Major, my name is Hirsch. I'm, you got a guy named Callie, can you tell me a little bit about that case? He said, oh, I don't know much about it, hold on. Oh yeah, he said, yeah, he's being, he's being held here, he's held, he didn't say where, he's being held um, for a military proceeding, an investigation. What did he do? He said, well, yeah, I, yeah the, the story we get here, the notes we have said he, he shot up a bar, you know, some prostitutes in a bar or something like that in Saigon, had a few drinks too many. That was the story, they, that was the officers, so okay, this is a real case. And, so the next question is, uh, what do you do? I got a lawyer, I, and I go, I go back and I find whatever record there is, and he does have a lawyer. He's got a lawyer, a, a lawyer named Judge Latimer. George Latimer was a Mormon on a Salt Lake City. I don't know if you know much about Mormons, but Mormons, they believe that the way the world is many years ago in the sky, 
um, there was a big fight between the good guys and the bad guys. And the good guys came out and they were the white guys and the guys that lost were the black guys. That's, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> That's about how racist Mormons were and are, although they like to pretend not. That's basically what, what was going on. You know, that's the way they saw the world, some divine conflict. Um, good and white, black and white, good and evil. Anyway, um, but Judge Latimer had been under court of military appeals. He was living in Salt Lake City. And at that time, um, uh, he'd been an army prosecutor. He'd been an army lawyer, a prosecutor, became a judge, then he became on the court of military appeals. Okay, so, uh, I call up Salt Lake City and I get on the phone. I, he, he takes the phone call. I said, I'm a reporter um, and, I, and I'm looking into the Cali case. Oh my, he says. Uh, what do you know? I said, I don't know much about it, but I'd like to talk to you about it, Your Honor. And he said, well, um, I think I said something to the effect that I'm, I'm, I've got a trip coming to California. Can I stop off in Salt Lake City or my plane stops there? Some horse shit I, I threw up just to make it casual, like I was going there anyway, and I wasn't, I did, tried not to breathe heavy. <laughs> and, and so he said, yeah, sure, come on out. And so we agreed I'd see him in a day or two at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'd taken a, a, one of the first flights. We lose time that way. I gained two hours. I can, I can take an eight o'clock flight and land close to 10 o'clock in Salt Lake in the morning. And so that afternoon I go to the, um, the, the Court of Military Appeals and I pull out about five or six of his decisions and I photocopy them, and I read them over the next day. I read all of his decisions, and it's the same stuff. What, happens in, what happened in Vietnam cases is a guy's convicted of raping um, uh, two women, or two guys are convicted of raping a couple of Vietnamese nurses, um, and they would claim they were Viet Cong, and they would be convicted, and the case would be appealed, and the Court of Military Appeals would reverse on grounds that there were no victims to testify, because they killed them. That would be the way it worked since you, they, were, they were accused of murdering people, and when it came to appeal, since there was nobody to testify to the other side, they, they, the case was dismissed. I'm, I'm not exaggerating, really strange stuff. And um, it's the court you want if you ever get in trouble. And so I go out there, and Latimer was a kind old geezer, and I come into his office, shake, and I say, before we talk, let me, let's talk stereo decisis, let's talk about some of these cases. So we spent about, 20 or 30 minutes talking about why I made that decision. And I'm, I'm being really sort of, I was interested and open and friendly. I'm sure he thought I was the nicest guy in the world. And at some point, um, he said, I said, now, so what's the story with Callie? He said, oh, it's a terrible misjustice. And he opens up his desk drawer and, and he's got a standard desk, you know, not like this, but a real sort of lawyer's desk, nothing, not like Abe Lincoln's desk, but the desk. And it takes out a folder, one of those manila folders that lawyers have, you know, it's, it's not sealed, it's just a manila folder with a clip on it. Um, and he um, puts it on his desk, and clearly that's the Cali file. And it, it, just then the phone rings, and it's a partner. I don't know if anybody knows lawyers, but lawyers' partners, all they talk about is money and bills and who's gonna, you know, they don't talk about stereotypes. And he has this painful conversation for two minutes with a partner about somebody who's not paid or they haven't done the billing. He says, excuse me, Mr. Hirsch, he says, I gotta go see a, I gotta see a partner for a minute. He said, is it all right? And I said, sure, you want me to leave? He said, no, no, it's okay. And he leaves. Now, here's where you come into action. What do I do? You gotta talk to me, what do I do? What? What? It's loud! Somebody speak up! <laughs> why? But look what's inside. But why do I have. Really? Okay, what? Why? Because. Because he's left it for you to look at. Do you know something? There was this fantastic rug he bought back for some trip in Asia. And he'd also left that there. Should I have opened the window and thrown it out to it, you know, in the, in the hallway outside <laughs> and gone and got it too? Did he leave the rug for me too? Well, did you think maybe he did? Or maybe, how about the, there was a beautiful piece of uh, pottery? Do I package it up and put it outside and pick it up later? <laughs> but okay, keep on going. I'm just, I'm just giving you an answer. He left it for me. Maybe he did. I mean, uh, that's his, I'm getting into his mind. Keep on going. What else? Who agrees? Come on. Yeah. What about the Menos camera? Make photos. I didn't have a camera, but if I had, that's an idea. Uh, I learned after that to always carry a tape recorder. You could always dictate it, but that's not as good as having a document. That's what the Snowden case is about. We'll talk about that later. Keep on going. Go ahead, anybody. Come on. What kind of case do you think you've got at this point? What did you say? I, I can't, you sound have a funny accent. What case do you think you have at this point? 
What? Well, let's put it this way. Um, if something as, as evil as I thought took place um, and he has a file on it, um, if you think I'm thinking this can end the war, I've got to do this to end the war, I'm thinking fame, fortune, glory, Pulitzer Prize. You don't think I'm, I'm there. So that's, that's how I'm thinking, I'm, wow, I'm going to get on the map. You know, despite the fact I work for a politician, some newspaper will hire me, at least one I want. Uh, but I'm, I'm just, so that's presumably there. Keep on going, let's go, what else? Why do you do it? Keep on going, because it's there? Media. Public interest, go ahead, yeah. All right, how, anybody think no? Do I, do I get a no here? <laughs> All right, let's go back. Phone call. Phone call comes, he says, oh my God, he says, ah, my partner, he's talking, no, we did the billing, whatever they said. He's, he's about 65, 70, almost as old as I am. Anyway, um, and he says, oh, Mr. Hirsch, excuse me, I've got to see my partner. And he takes, he put the envelope there, he takes the envelope and opens the desk drawer and puts it in the desk drawer and closes it, doesn't lock it, and leaves. What do I do then? Anything changes? Come on! What do you do? Open the drawer and take it. Keep on going. Who else? You're getting to some, you don't want to be caught doing it, right? I don't have a camera. Keep on going, oh you evil people, keep on going. Uh, come on, anybody worried? Nah, look at you, look at this. Okay. Okay, I can get, uh, because if he catches me looking at it, it's all over. I mean, that's, what, that's the argument. I could, of course, barricade the door, which would be a better thing to do. Put a door against it. And of course, then I could also throw it out the window and pick it up later, I was assuming, along with the rug and the table and the chairs, all those things he left for me. Keep on going. Just run away. Uh-huh, okay. Very Ukrainian. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on going. What else? How do you know that? Okay, let's go back to the phone conversation. Okay, let's go back. And so he has that conversation. He says, excuse me. He takes the folder and he walks to a file cabinet. He's got a nice, you know, lawyers have these nice wooden four drawer, maybe three or four of them for his cases. And he doesn't have a, there's no, it's interesting. He did, he, he, as far as I know, there was a central secretary for a bunch of lawyers. So the files are in his room, in his office. It's a nice big office in Salt Lake, some downtown building. And he opens up a file drawer and he lays it in, doesn't necessarily put it away, just puts it there and maybe even leaves the drawer open. Let's say he does, I don't remember. Well, we'll talk about what I remember in a minute. Um, and he, but he makes an effort to put it in the desk drawer uh, in, in the file. And he doesn't, maybe he doesn't slam it in, but he leaves it there. What do I do? Take it. Okay, keep on going. Who else? Anybody get in a doubt? Yeah. You swine. <laughs> you swine. You can't do it. It's not yours. It's his. You can't do it. Uh, would I have, now, if you want to know what really happened, none of those things. But I just want to show you what evil people you are <laughs> and, why, and why nobody should ever trust a reporter. Nobody should ever trust a reporter. It's just hopeless. Um, uh, would I do it now? Uh, I got all my prizes. Would I have done it then? If I, let's say I'm working for the Chicago, I work, I'm out of Chicago, I was working for the Chicago, I worked for the AP, Associated Press in Chicago for a couple of years. And so I'm working, Chicago's a good newspaper city. You can do what you want. And when I was there, I never had, I used to park my car on the sidewalk at a police press, just park it on the sidewalk, and there's a bar, street of bars called Rush Street, park it on the sidewalk, just put my police press back and just go and do what I want. Nobody, cops would come and just ignore me because they just, we worked all together. It was, uh, it was so corrupt, Chicago. There's a comedian named Mort Saul who was a famous satirist about Chicago. And Chicago has a big highway, the Outer Drive. I don't know what they call the ring circle here. It's an Outer Drive. He used to describe it publicly as the last outpost of collective bargaining. You'd be caught speeding 100 miles an hour and the cops would say, oh, that's going to cost you a 20 and you'd give them a 20 and drive off. You know, it's unbelievable. They do it in France too. They always just sometimes reach in your wallet and say, what do you got? <laughs> I've been stopped there, it's crazy. But um, um, so 
Uh, what happened is he did open it up and he was going to read me stuff from it, selective stuff, I think, because he said, Callie, this is a miscarriage of justice, a horrible miscarriage of jealous justice, he said. Who's got it going? Turn it off, yeah. Or let me hear it. Anyway. <laughs> and so he, um, um, and so he, he's, he, there, no call took place. That didn't happen. I just did that, as I say, to demonstrate a point that's so easily demonstrated. There's in journalism, I've done this at Columbia, I've done it at, you know, everybody falls in. There's, there's no, you guys, we reporters, we really sort of, you know, uh, theoretically, he's got, Callie has uh, a, for a right to a trial that without me reading his lawyer's notes before, um, before anybody wants, without permission. Anyway, but that's, we can talk about all that. And so what he did is he kept that on his desk and talked to me and I don't know, I had little kids then, and one of the things I was learning about little kids is when they first learn to read, they don't really know that you, you can't read upside down. You know, you, they used to read upside down, well, at least one of my kids, my first one did, he read upside down as well as front, the other way, he didn't know which was the right way. So it's, it made all sense to him. So while he was talking to me and I was having what seemed to be amiable conversation, I was writing the first page, or the, the front page, because I saw the word secret on it. I was writing what it said. And the first sentence said, I was writing one letter at a time, upside down, trying to, you know, I didn't know what, I didn't know what the words meant. I wasn't just writing letters, space, letter, space, because I had to have a conversation. And the first sentence said, the Army has found, uh, pursuant, it's, there's something, and the, uh, the grand jury, the, uh, the equivalent in America is the grand jury, I don't know what they call it here, a preliminary investigation, preliminary hearing, I'm sure you have something like that. Before a criminal case, you have, a, you have to present evidence and the judge decides whether or not he's going to hold the potential victim or the potential suspect to a trial, a preliminary inquiry had found that William, uh, First Lieutenant William L. Kelly Jr. was guilty, um, was, had been, uh, was responsible for the um, um, uh, uh, premeditated murder, get this sentence, of 109 oriental human beings in such and such village in South Vietnam. And I swear to God, I covered the Pentagon Mel Laird was the new Secretary of Defense. I, I hadn't worked there. I worked there when McNamara was. Robert McNamara was a psychotic liar. Robert McNamara was just a psychotic liar, as so many people in high office apparently are. I mean, he just didn't know what he was lying. I, I shouldn't use the word psychotic because I don't know if it's a medical word. He was a, 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 system, he was a serious liar. <laughs> uh, but I don't know whether he was, his mind was split or not, but he was really strange. Anyway, um, uh, by that I mean he just couldn't cope with the fact that the war was being lost and the murder was going on every day. He just wouldn't deal with it. He just couldn't deal with it. He couldn't take it. Anyway, so Mel Laird was a nicer guy. He was a congressman. And I, I actually did something. I actually, before we published the story, I went to a friend in that office and we reported this and I said, you know what? We're going to kill a lot of American boys if we use the word oriental. It's the suggestion is that 10 orient, in, in, oriental lives equal one, you know, or was it, was it uh, let's see, do 10 Oriental lives equal two uh, Hispanic or two African American and one white? What's, what's the number? What does it mean, Oriental? I mean, how the hell can you? They're human beings, you idiots. And I, they, they, I said, I'm not going to write it if you take it out now. He said, we're going to take it out. <laughs> so I didn't write it because it, that seemed to me to be such an offensive word. I know I shouldn't have done it maybe in a way, but I'm not a purist. It just seemed that more Americans would be killed if I said that, you know, gratuitously, as they probably were anyway, because, you know, racism, don't talk to me about racism. Anybody who does me lie. And I'll be, anybody who thinks, you know, I always say that one thing about, about Bill Clinton, uh, you know, philanderer as he was, in 1999, he bombed, he ordered the uh, NATO forces, including mostly American, to bomb, to bomb Serbia. And at that, with that act, he was the first American president since World War II to bomb white people. So don't talk to me about it. That's just a fact. Take it, take it any way you want it. It's easier, apparently, to go after, you know, Asians and other countries, Grenada, if you will, South Korea. Anyway, I just think racism is very, very strong in a lot of what we do, particularly in right now. And um, um, anyway, um, and we don't, we don't want to look at it. But so um, at what happened then is um, uh, 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 I copied this, and this is dynamite. I walk out, I said nothing to the judge. I had, I copied the first public graphs. Oh my God, 109. And it turned out it was 565. 
were killed that day. But Kelly was, they found Kelly guilty of that many, directing that many. There were five other second lieutenants there. It was just a mass murder. It was an insane, just another day in the job, maybe. I don't think so, but it was pretty, a lot of that went on in Vietnam. Uh, what happened is a group of kids um, had gone, there was a unit, it was called, this is why I get so mad at McNamara, um, and why I was so proud to be working for Eugene McCarthy, because what, what they did, because in, in the middle 1960s, dissent with the war began to get bad, bad, and particularly here in England, there was a lot more opposition to the Vietnam War here in England, and it was always a problem for us that Europe didn't appreciate what we were doing to protect Europe in Vietnam. And so, um, I'm, that's not, I'm not exaggerating. And so what happened is, uh, we had a draft then. I, I, was, I went in the army because I was gonna be drafted. And so you had to go, everybody had to go, it was compulsory. And we, did, we now have a volunteer army like you did, but then we didn't, we had a draft. And so when I was in the army, my bunkmate was an art major, got a PhD, a master's degree, later went on to be an art teacher from the University of Wisconsin, and one of my, one of my buddies was a, later became a professional golfer. He had a sort of different group of people. He had the yahoos, but it was different. And because the war was so crazy and so destructive, there was a lot of dissent being generated, anti-war feelings, not just from the, the war, you know, not just from the kids from the barrios and the ghettos and from the farmlands, but from middle, class, middle America. And so McNamara decided that he was gonna lower the standards of the army to a degree in which, and argue it was called Project 100,000. We were gonna bring more people in who couldn't get in because they hadn't the education or the test scores, and that meant you were dealing with many more Hispanics, many more rural kids from South in America, many more African-American kids from the ghettos where everybody knows in, in, in poor neighborhoods, education is less, less well-funded, the scores are lower, so they brought in these people. And most of the kids in the unit were Project 100,000, and they were mostly much more people of color. And McCarthy used to say, I, I admit I pushed him into it, but he said it publicly, what we're doing in this war is changing the color of the American corpses. That's what he used to say. It was pretty tough talk I mean, to have a guy running for president saying that. And so it was all made, made it worthwhile for a little while to do politics. Don't ever do it. Don't any of you ever do it. It's horrible. But anyway, um, and so uh, the kids in that unit were kids, I'd say, 55% white kids from rural areas. They weren't very educated. It was an, a division that wasn't very good called the American Division, full of no good, and it wasn't the 82nd Airborne that you read, 101st paratroopers. It was just a bunch of grunts who were in the field all the time. They got to Vietnam in January of 1968, and they were been, all they did was slog it out and march around and beat up people, gradually, increasingly get violent because the officers didn't stop them. It was a society they didn't understand, and, and uh, they couldn't, uh, they, they would, in, in 90 days before the My Lai mission took place in March, maybe 80 days, uh, the company of 100 lost about 15 people to booby traps or sniper here and there. They never saw the enemy. They increasingly took it out on people. They saw old people. They would rifle butt somebody who was in their way, an old person, and no officer would stop them. And so the violence got sort of ingrained. And meanwhile, they're in the field, they're living like, you know, not very well, no showers, bad food, drugs kept the GIs going, booze kept the officers and enlisted men going. But the night before, and they finally were told, tomorrow we're going into a village called Milai, and we're gonna see the enemy. We've got great intelligence, they're gonna be there. The 48th North Vietnamese Battalion, hardcore, it's gonna be, you finally gonna get a chance to pay back for your buddies that got killed. And one of the things about Anybody who's in the military will tell you, after a little while, the flag has nothing to do with it. You, you, you're gonna go kill others because your buddy was hurt. It's all about your buddy. That's one of the things you can, if you read the fiction and the nonfiction, that's what it's about. It's not, not, you're not going and killing people because of the American flag. You're doing it because you wanna pay back. Pay back, there was a book written by a guy named Joe Klein called Payback, which was exactly right. And so these kids became brutalized. And that morning they marched in, and I must say, they did their dope until one o'clock, and they did their booze until one o'clock, and they slept for a couple hours, at four o'clock they got on choppers, and they went there to meet their fate. They didn't know, they thought they were gonna be in a real battle for the first time, whatever fear they had of dying, and et cetera, and, but wanting any chance to kill. And said they walked into this large village in which at five o'clock in the morning, their women were making uh, boiling water for the morning rice, and old men, women, and children no young people, and they put him in the three ditches. Don't ask me why, how. 
They put him into three ditches and they just shot and shot and shot and shot. Took all day, officers were watching it. One of the great stories of all time, I must say. And it was, by the way, it was all mine. I was very happy to have it. But anyway, at that point, I didn't know where it went. Um, so when I saw that charge sheet, I said to the lawyer, where is he? I, he said, I can't tell you. And the charge, he was charged at Fort Jackson. I said, look, I know the Army. If he's charged at Fort Jackson, he's there. Um, uh, judge, I know you don't want to tell me anything, but I'm going there right now. It was, it's, by now it was 1 o'clock. I've been in his office a couple hours, maybe noon. It's going to fly back east. And uh, so uh, I just hope you'll just, if I'm going the wrong place, you don't have to tell me, just tell me that. He said nothing. So I went. And I got on a plane and I ended up, uh, uh, let's see, uh, by the time I got to the airport, and I'm going east, and so I got stuck overnight, uh, I think Chicago, someplace like that, and I ended up taking a morning flight to, uh, to South Carolina, and I'd been up all night, and I got there early in the morning, and I rented a car, and I went to the base, and this is when, 69, we didn't have the security that we have now, I could just drive on. I drove on, and I was looking for Cali. I was sure he was there. And so I'm gonna find this son of a bitch, because I've seen the charge sheet. And so, and you have to understand, uh, the Stone case shows, as, as Duncan Campbell and others in America, I, I, I too, James Badford, we've all written about everybody spies on everybody, but a document is what makes Snowden's document turn. We'll talk about that tonight, I'm sure. It's important to get a document. In fact, you can't do it without a document because that's just the way the world is. You can write anything you want. Um, um, uh, anyway, uh, so I figure he's in jail. And it's a big base with the headquarters and five big areas, huge base. They train for rangers, they train for parachuters, they train to, for enlisted men, the first in, you know, basic training. And there's five um, satellite bases around the headquarters base. And we're talking about a place that's you know, maybe 50 miles in, in circumference. So I start driving, and what I do, I've got this ratty suit, and uh, I'm tired, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not that tired. And I've got a little suit and a little dinky tie and a little briefcase, and I pull up, I go to the, to the brig, the army jail, in each, each of the bases. I pull up to the first brig, right in the front spot, officers for the senior officers parking. I pull up and I slam the door loud, and I walk in, Sergeant, I want Kelly out here right now. And they say, who, Kelly? We got nobody, we got, uh, let me look, no, I got nobody with name Kelly, you sure with a C? I said, with a C? Nope. Okay, so I go to the next base. I drive the three of them and he's not there. It's pretty clear to me, I got a problem. Wherever he is, he's not in a brig. Uh, you know, he's not there. They've done something with him. So I go, to the, I go back to the main base, the headquarters, Camp Funston. I know oh, that's some other place, but some, some camp. It was just the headquarters, where the headquarters of the, of the division. It's actually, I think, a corps, Army Corps, 18th Corps. It's a big, big, up, big base. And I go to the headquarters and th there's a PX, you know, a place to get a hamburger in the shop. Uh, um, and I'm sitting there um, and I start using the phone. And I call up every club I can think of. Swimming club, tennis club, our military bases have all these things like every place does, you know, tennis club, aquatic like club, I don't know. I just call up, call up and call up and call up. And then I call gas stations around. Hi, I'm looking for, you know, I got a friend that's got a car. His name is Bill Kelly. He's got an old car. You, you know Kelly? You know, because sometimes you never know how you're going to make it. Um, now, in the last 20 years, it's very simple. You can get somebody to get into Amex or MasterCard or Visa for you. Now, that's how easy it is. Even I can do that. And I'm computer illiterate. You can get that done. Boom, boom, boom. So you can, get, you can find any. But in those days, you couldn't. In fact, most people didn't have credit cards in those days. They were just starting um, and only in the 60s. And so um, I do all that, and I, I go nowhere. And um, by now, it's, I started about 6, 7 in the morning. I haven't slept. But by now, it's about 1 o'clock, and I've made 100. There was a free phone, and Army bases have a free phone. I didn't have to put quarters in, thank God. And so um, I look at the phone book. I'm sitting there looking at the base phone book. When I was in the Pentagon, covering the Pentagon, Every three months, the Pentagon changes phone books because the military are very, very, they're very movable. They're always nomadic. They're always, so there was a new phone book. And this now, uh, I learned this in, um, uh, it was now late September uh, when I was at Fort Jackson. I learned this in early September. It had been about three or four weeks of just chasing around. I got into this point. I found, had a name. 
and I knew that there was such a person, I knew he was charged, and I knew it was much more serious than anybody was saying, but I couldn't find him, he wasn't listed, and I knew he was on this base somewhere. So the previous phone book, and the lawyer said he'd come back in August of 69. What happened took place a year and a half later. Callie stayed on, re-enlisted as an officer. And most of, the, most of the kids in the unit were home by then, but I didn't even know that. And so I was looking at, it was, um, still September, I was looking at a new phone book for September, but Callie had come back, his lawyer mentioned he'd come back in summer. So I went to the base phone, phone booth for the Army base, separate from the AT&T phone company, and I got this, the, I asked for the chief operator, and I finally got her. And I said, operator, you know what? And when he came back, he was not guilty. He hadn't been prosecuted. He just was going back to face it. So he came back and somebody who was, had a number and a name, he had to be in the system, so I said, operator, I want you to do me a favor. Um, would you get the June phone book? We're already, now we're already got a September. I want the last new listings for the June book. That would have been late August. Before, you, you know what I'm talking about? Me, you don't even know about phone books. The way it works now, in the old days, of phone books as of about five years ago, when they changed, they put out a phone book, and then if somebody moved, there'd be a new listing. You could call the operator and get the new listing for the persons who weren't in the phone book. None, everything's computerized now, so it's not, I know this is apple and oranges, but it was a big deal. It was a smart move. And she, sure enough, there was a William L. Cowley listed at an engineering base, and Cowley was an infantry officer, and having been in the Army, I was, I was, I was prejudging the racism, you know, I talk, about, I talk about systems and don't like each other. I was just telling, I have a friend in the CIA, and after 9-11, I asked my friend who was an operator in the CIA why the people in the CIA don't work with the FBI or the, or the NSA, National Security Agency. Nobody seemed to know anything about the guys who killed, the, the, the guys who did the 9-11, the, the, the group of 19 guys that, that we paid so much attention to who, who hit New York and knocked on the airplanes. And I, my friend in the CIA said to me, what? You, you're asking me about why I don't cooperate with other agencies? He said, hey, the FBI catches bank robbers. We in the CIA rob banks. He said, the NSA? When you go talk to the NSA guy, all he's done, he's looking down, not even at his own brown shoes, but at your brown shoes with a protractor in his pocket. I'm not gonna talk to that guy. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no colloquy. It just doesn't happen, no, no, anyway. So she told me about a place called an engineering battalion, way out, some base that I'd already gone to the brig at. But engineering, so Callie was there. That's where he came, and they parked him in an engineering battalion. I find it. I race out there. It's, uh, now it's early, af mid-afternoon. I race out there, and it's about 2 in the afternoon. It's one of these new army barracks. The army I was in was pup tents. This was an army barracks, three stories, concrete, three stories on one side, three stories on another side with a one-story one, one corridor where the officer, had his, the officer in charge had his, had his office in the middle between the two. Oh, my God. He's got to be here because the phone book says he's there. So I park my rental car a block away, walk into the back door, and I'm, it's mid, middle of the day. The guys are doing whatever they're doing in an engineering battalion, digging holes or, I don't know, building bridges. I don't know what they're doing. And uh, I walk through one side. Every bunk is made. You know, when I was in the Army, you could, you could drop. The deal was you had to drop a quarter and had to bounce. You had made the bed that tight. You could learn how to do it. And every bed, nobody there. And then I got to get to the other side. And in between on that one corridor was one of those uh, offices that had a door in the, the door with hinges in the middle. The top half was separate from the bottom half. The top half was open because it was still a beautiful day by now, as I said, late September, October maybe. And it was a beautiful day and, um, um, and it was hot. Um, and so uh, I do what my basic training, I crawl between that side so because that, I crawl underneath the door. I don't want anybody to see me going there. I get to the other side, and sure enough, on the second floor, second floor, the three-story, there's a guy sleeping on a top bunk. I got on my figure. So I go to the bunk, and I kick it. I'm being assertive. And some guy wakes up. He's sleeping. And, and the, the, the shirt doesn't say Cali. It says some, there's a Polish name, Os something. I exchanged Christmas cards with him and somebody else. And oh my god, it's not, I sit back. And I said, oh my God, you're not Kelly, some 20-year-old blonde kid. And because reporters are reporters, I say, okay, what are you doing here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? What's your story? Why are you sleeping? What the hell is going on? He said, ah, oh. he said, it's so crazy. I'm, he's from Ottumwa, Iowa, which is a big farm city in Iowa, and it's fall. 
It's, it's, I did my two years, I did v a year in Vietnam, I'm supposed to be mustered out and I lost my records and they're holding me here until I can find new records. I said, oh my God, that's terrible. He said, yeah, I'm missing harvest. My father's going nuts. We're harvesting without me. And then I've been gone for two years. I want to go and here I am stuck here. I said, so what do you do? He said, oh, I've got no job. The only thing I do is sort the mail. I said, the mail? Ever hear, <laughs> ever hear of a guy named Callie? He said, you mean the guy that shot up everybody? And I said, yeah. I said, that's the guy. I'm looking for him. He said, well, I said, where is he? What is, he said, well, I've never seen him. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the mail comes here, but I'm supposed to collect it every month, every week. I collect it and Smitty from Brigade in the Army, it's like I'm sure in your Army, it's company, it's platoon, company, uh, brigade, division. The higher headquarters was, this was a, 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 a this was a, a, a brigade, this wasn't a, this was a, just a company. And the brigade, which is probably, in, the brigade headquarters is probably in control of five or six engineering companies. The engineering brigade headquarters was somewhere else. He said, and Smitty from brigade, the clerk over there in headquarters there, he comes and gets the mail every week. So where is Smitty? He said, well, he's at Brigade's headquarters. I said, where's that? He said, well, it's over in so-and-so, this other camp. And I said, uh, I figured the guy hasn't done anything. I said, what, you, what time you got? It was now 2.12, let's say. Okay, in eight minutes, I'm gonna beat it out here down a side door. I've got a red Chevy, rent a car. In eight minutes, I'm gonna go in the side door on the other side. I want you to, in exactly eight minutes, come out and jump in and take me to Smitty's. Okay, he says. So I do the thing, you know, action. The guy needed action. So I get, I get the car and I go there. He jumps in and we drive over to, to, we drive about, you know, these bases are big. Now it's getting close to the end of the day. There's more traffic. It's now about 2.30, 3 o'clock. And we're driving over to this, um, uh, another camp. And it was a complicated place and I love it. He, the kid's about 20. He insisted on being driven back. So I drove him back, really very anxious. So then I come back and I pull him in. It's a, this is a wooden headquarters, a brigade headquarters. And there's a sergeant, it's a beautiful day, and there's a sergeant leaning against the door. It's the end of a work day. He's got a big toothpick and he's got some gold teeth. He's just leaning happy. And Smitty, I was told by the kid, was very unhappy because all of his stripes had been pulled off. He was a sergeant, and he'd, been, he'd lost all of his stripes in some fight in a bar. And so he was very unhappy. And so I'm trying to figure out, I gotta get Smitty out of there. So I pull up. And I jump out and I say to them, Mr. Assertive, Sergeant, Smitty out here right now. And the sergeant starts laughing, oh boy, what's Smitty do now? You know, here's this guy. And he says, yes, sir. You know, doesn't say, who are you? Smitty comes out and he, I say, in the car. And he gets in the car and I say, hey kid, I got no problem with you. I said, I just, I'm, I don't mean to scare you, but I got no problem. I'm just looking for Callie. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you get his mail. You know who Callie is? Yeah, the guy that shot up everybody. I said, yeah, all right. And I said, but I'm looking for Callie. He said, I don't know what to tell you, he said. He, I said, well, what happens? He said, well, he lives off base. And I said, where? He said, uh, I don't know. He said, Somebody, some second lieutenant comes. He lives with a bunch of second lieutenants just out of West Point. West Point's the Army Academy. They graduate in the summer. Poor West Point kids. West Point kids, four years in the Army being officers, and they learn the spirit and the core, and they go and they spend a couple of months in a place like Fort Jackson, and then they go overseas for the fight the war in Vietnam and they get to a company and the first thing they say is, men, we're going to shape up. Uh, no dope, no drinking, we're going to go on patrol every night, we're going to go get the guys. And as I later learned, doctors began, after I did Milai, doctors in Japan began to write me all the time. They were seeing nothing but second lieutenants with holes in the back. They'd get shot by their all the kids. A guy named O'Brien wrote a book about fragging. He wrote, a, he wrote about it, Tim O'Brien, that wonderful Vietnam War now. He wrote a, one of his short stories about the fragging of an officer. They all wanted to do it. They had a contest to see who would kill him. <laughs> put a, they put a grenade, it was putting a grenade under his bunk. Everybody wanted to do it. I mean, just let's get the officer because he's not going to let us smoke our dope. And we're not going to make it without our dope. And by now they're doing horse. And they're not, they're not just tie sticks. Guys are really into some serious stuff. By now it's all crazy. And so, so I said to Smitty, so, well, how do you know what you know? He said, well, I've got his file. I said, what do you mean? I've got his, the Army file is called the 201, the basic personnel file. We still have Callie's file here. So I said, get it. And he says, okay. <laughs> so he goes back in, comes back in, and in his blouse, Army has a little shirt, little short sleeve shirt, then was the uniform. He opens it up, 
gives me the file, Lieutenant Kelly, open up the first page is the page I've seen in the lawyer's office. Now I have it. I sit down and I copy everything. It was one pair, I, did, I don't have a camera. I just have a notebook and a pen that work. I always think if, I, if Jesus ever called, my pen wouldn't work. Anyway, I, I take notes and I learn, I get the address of where he is. And um, um, uh, I send Smitty back. Nobody knows anything. I go to the house where Callie lives off base. By now it's rush hour. And he's sure enough living with four guys out of, out of West Point. And they bring me and they invite me for a drink. And I say, okay, okay, we talk. And they tell me what Callie had told them about, about how it was innocent. It was just crossfire. He didn't kill anybody. It was a, just a combat. It wasn't just a murder incorporated mission, which by now I knew wasn't true. And then it turned out Callie wasn't there. Where does he live? Callie lives, get this, in the senior officers' quarters, quarters for colonels and generals. There's a select little office group in Fort Jackson. It's an area with enclosed area with a swimming pool, beautiful condos for the officers who are on temporary duty. The last place I would ever look for a lieutenant who was accused of murdering a lot of people that's going to get the army's in a panic about it. So I go there. Now it's five, six o'clock. I've had a couple of scotches and I go there. And it's about 100 units. And it's five o'clock and there's three floor, maybe, maybe 150 units, maybe 50 in each unit, 25 on each floor, two story, very elegant. And I just start at five o'clock knocking on doors. I keep a little list and I knock, knock, knock. And about one third, and I, the door, you know, when somebody comes, I say, hi, I'm looking for Bill Kelly. What? Some general will say, who? You know, get out of here. What are you doing? We're not buying anything. I'm not out of time. Is that why you're making that Two minutes. Oh, no. Yeah. Three. That's terrible because um, um, it's going to go, well, you can all leave. I'll just talk to nobody. <laughs> what are rules? Why should I believe his rules any more than I believe anybody in the Army? So I don't believe your rules. We'll take, I'll do it fast. So to make a long story short, I spent hours knocking on doors. I can't get it. And by now it's dark. Now it's dark and I'm really tired. And I'm going to go sleep. I'm going to go to Motel 6. I got no money. I'm going to go to some motel, sleep a couple hours and come back at 1 o'clock, figure these guys are playboys and knock on the other doors. If Callie's there, the kid's there, he's there. And as I'm walking out, there's a guy working on a car way in the corner of a parking lot with a long rope, you know, some guy, and he's fixing his engine underneath it on one of those rollers. And I'm too tired, I want to, enough of the hell of it. I walk over and I say, hey, I'm looking for Bill, Bill Kelly. The guy slides out. Uh, he's a helicopter pilot and officer. And he says, who, who are you? I said, I'm a reporter. I'm just, you know, I'm tired, Jack. I'm sorry, I don't mean to bother you. He said, no, no, come on with me. And he said, follow me. And I follow him and he goes in. He says, Kelly lives upstairs. And I said, oh. And he washes his hand, and he's, I said, where is he? He said, I don't know. He said, actually, he said, he, he's on, he does motorboating a lot. I hadn't called the motorboat club. That's one club I hadn't, because he's out water skiing. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. And, but he'll be back. And so he gives me another drink, and he tells me, he's, he's a cynic. He's, he's a guy I stayed in touch with. He says, it's a disaster. You know, God knows what Kelly did. You know, he's not telling the truth to anybody. By 2 o'clock, I'm done. Kelly's not home. I'm outside, and I remember standing, there was a naked bulb and a lot of flies and bugs hanging around outside the door. And I gotta get to my car, I gotta get some sleep. And as I start walking away, he said, he said uh, Rusty, hey, Cy, si, Rusty's here. I don't wanna meet Rusty. It turns out his name is Rusty Callie. They call him Rusty. So here's Callie. And Callie says, oh yeah, my lawyer told me you might find me, he says. I don't forget that. He said, my lawyer called him and said, Hirsch might find me. I don't know how they thought I was gonna do it. I really don't know. But there he is, he invites me in. And he's telling me this cock and bull story about everything's okay, I got no problem. And uh, he wants me to stick around because his girlfriend is a nurse at the hospital. And when she comes, we're gonna go get a bottle of whiskey and have a steak. And, and then at one point, he goes to the john to take a leak, he says. And the door is one of those doors with a glass mirror in it. And I watch him and he throws up arterial blood. We've been drinking some beer. Arterial blood, he's got an ulcer this big. Anyway, Callie tells me a story. I go back to the lawyer. The lawyer says, oh Jesus. He says, listen, I got a problem because the story he told you is not one he's told the grand jury. He said, uh, uh, you write that, he's gone. I'll make you a deal, Hirsch. Tell me what you're gonna write and I'll check it for you and any editor you wanna sell it to, he can talk to me. And he, he had a reputation. He said, just take the interview out. 
And I talked to my, by now I got a lawyer myself, my, one of my buddies, I went to law school, one of my buddies was a corporate lawyer, a very smart guy in Washington. He became my lawyer for 50 years, by the way. And he, he said, take the deal. Because this, and then the guy gave, I wrote a 1500, first story was 1500 words. And uh, uh, George Latimer changed 20 facts. He gave me the date, he gave me this. Later, um, many years later, an academic sent me the army, when I did a story, the army did an analysis of it. Uh, and it was, it was declassified and some guy, some European wrote a book about all this later, about sort of like what the hunt was like. And in the classified documents, they concluded I had access to all the files because every fact was straight because they had no idea the lawyer was cleaning up. And the lawyer then, I started, we started calling editors and fit, we told editors, you can call Callie's lawyer. And Callie's lawyer, to his credit, said the story's accurate. I don't agree with his interpretation. I, uh, but the story, as he wrote it, uh, is accurate. And so 35 papers, we sent it to them overhead, 35 papers ran this freelancer story saying there was a major massacre and the army's in big trouble, which it was. I'll just tell you one more story. And I started finding kids and I started seeing them. And I wrote five stories. I ended up writing two books about it, one book about the massacre and then a wonderful book that nobody read about the cover-up. It was called Cover Up. It was about how everybody in the Army knew everything and covered up, but then nobody cared about, you know, at a certain point, when you lose the war, it's, nobody's interested in it. I always joke that they, print ten, they printed 10,000 copies of the book, my publisher, and people Xeroxed it to return it. We got 20,000 back. Uh, you know, and it, was sold. it was a lead review in all the papers, but nobody bought it. Anyway, so it goes. Um, but I saw a lot of people. I began to see kids in the unit. One of the kids began an interview with me by saying, oh, you mean it was, he said, well, it was like a Nazi type thing. We just started shooting. And here's what happened. I never want to not tell a story without letting you know this, because I don't want to keep this. There was a kid named Paul Meadlow that had been picked up from the farm outside of Terre Haute, Indiana, a farm boy, 16, in the Army, Project 100,000 kid. He wasn't, very, he wasn't very quick, very decent kid. He was a farm kid. And when Callie, when they went into the village and they found nobody there, as I said, they put him in the ditches, people in the three big ditches, and Callie ordered the, 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 his soldiers, he had about, there were about 80 in, his, in the company. He was one of the one or two or three second lieutenants to open up and start shooting him in the ditch. Most of the Hispanics and most of the African-American guys didn't shoot. Um, they were afraid n to be, they didn't want to be caught not shooting because they thought Whitey might kill him. So they shot high, but they, or they shot in the ground. One guy shot himself in the foot to get out of there, a guy named Herbert Carter. Um, um, most of them couldn't stand what they saw. The, his, the minority kids, many of the white kids, I talked to 80, 65 of the 80 guys there over the next year and a half. What a fun that was. Um, you know, I had a kid that age. Yeah, well, you'll tell you about it in a second. Most of the, and Milo was one that clip after clip, uh, it's an M, M1, and if you hold it down, you could, it, it, it's got a 20 weapon clip, the same weapon I used. If you hold the trigger in the middle, it becomes semi-automatic. You can fire a clip. He just put clip after clip in. And everybody, other guys stopped because they were just killing people. And by end, they had shot everybody. Just shot and shot and shot. And at some point when it was over, they, were, they stopped and they were eating their lunch, K-rations, around the ditch, near the ditch. And there was the usual raping and murdering going on along with that. And they set things on fire. It's a big village. And then it's, they heard a keening noise. And they heard this keening, and they didn't know what it was. And some mother at the bottom of the pit had put a two-year-old Vietnamese, oh, Vietnamese, obviously, boy under her stomach, and he had not been shot. And he crawled up through the blood, maybe he was three. And when he reached the top, he began to run. I like to say through the rice field, but there was just a field. And Lieutenant Kelly said to Meadlo, the most compliant, plug him, Paul, his name was. And Meadlo somehow won, he couldn't do it. And Lieutenant Callie, um, officers had a, a, a carbine, a, a, a smaller rifle. And Callie, the big man on the block, was about, you know, he wasn't big at all, but, and, you know, there's a TV show called, called Hawaii Five O. The guys in the unit used to call him Hawaii Four and a Half, because he was just, anyway, he was just, he, and so Callie took the carbine and ran behind him and shot him in the back of the head. And this is a repressed memory, because the next day they went on patrol, they pretended it didn't happen. The Hispanic and black kids wore arm, black armbands, but the officers told them to take it off. They wore them for a day, but the officers would get those off. And Callie and, and Milo, the next day, stepped on a landmine and blew off his right leg. And they had to call a chopper to medevac him, med get him out. And Milo, for the next half hour, did this chant. 
God has punished me, Lieutenant Kelly, and God is going to punish you. You can't, you can't, no fiction writer can beat this stuff, I'm telling you. This is something Philip Roth used to write about. Reality is so devastating. God has punished me, and the kids in the know would say, get them out of here, get them out of here, they don't want to hear this. Finally, the chopper came and took them away. And I hear about this three weeks into the story. I wrote five stories, and the whole American press corps just waited for my stories. I just wrote one after the other every week and we, we charge a hundred bucks a piece for the first one and by the second one the London Times, Louis Heron then was running it, was paying me five thousand bucks. We were making money, I'd never seen money before. I was, you know, we were, everybody was buying it and I was alone as a freelancer with this story. For five weeks they sat there and let me do it. They, the editors would say, when are you going to have another story? It was just amazing. It was an amazing sort of time. So, me though, I'm look, I hear about him three weeks into the story. Jesus Christ, nobody had told me. I'd seen five or six, seven, eight kids in the unit by then. And finally, somebody told me about it. I went back and called the other kids. They said, oh yeah, I meant to tell you about it. It was pretty traumatic. Me though, M-E-A-D-L-O, I'm, I'm in some city in the West Coast, and at that time, you didn't have to pay for information. So the same thing with the phone. I start calling, he's, they said he's in Indiana somewhere, Southern Indiana. So I start calling every phone, every phone system in Southern Indiana, M-E-A-D-L-O. I finally get one with that spelling. New Goshen, Indiana. It's east of something called Terre Haute. Don't worry about it. It's below, it's below Chicago, which is below Indianapolis, which is below Terre Haute. It's just, it's just a town of nothing, 1,200 people. And I finally get a Meadlow. I don't know where I was, somewhere in the West Coast. And I call, and I get this old Southern voice when I call. Hi, my name is Hirsch. Is Paul around? Uh, yes, well, what, what do you want? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just somebody who wanted to talk to Paul about his days in the Army. How's his foot? Well, it's doing all right, but you know, real Southern, very slow Southern voice. Um, and I said, well, I wanted to come talk to him about what happened. She said, well, I don't know if he'll talk to you about it. He doesn't say much. I said, it's all right, ma'am, if I come, I'll come tomorrow. She said, well, I can't promise. I mean, he's here. Hangs up. I go and I fly. I rent a car and I drive down there. And no GPS. Are you kidding me? I had, it took me hours to find this city. And it's a chicken farm. Meadows live in an old, ratty chicken farm. No man around. The cages are all over. The wires are down. There's two wooden shacks. If any of any vision of the South back in sharecroppers' days, it's really the South. And she comes out, and I pull up, ratty suit, my ratty car, and I say, "I'm the I'm the reporter called yesterday." And I said, "Is is he there?" She said, "Well, he's in there." And I said, "And she's about 50 and looks 70. We're talking about hard scrabble life. This is hardcore life. And this is rural, uneducated South." And I said, is it okay? And she said, well, I don't know what will talk. And then she looked at me, and this lady, this little old lady, she said to me, I gave them a good boy, and they sent me back a murderer. And that's what we're in this business for, those kind of stories. You can't always get them, but they're there. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's an amazing business. You all should be very happy to be in it despite the problems. I know we have incredible problems. It's in Kuwait now. Newspapers are failing. But there's going to be more opportunities for all of you because there's a whole new internet world that we haven't figured out yet. It's not sorted through, but it will be. And it's going to be better. It will be better than what we have. But it's not there yet. Anyway, that's my message. Goodbye. I'll tell you one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. It turned out when he came back, he spent four months, Paul, in a hospital in Tokyo. That's why doctors in Tokyo got to know me because of that story and because of him. And he never spoke, he was comatose. They fixed his leg, gave him an artificial leg, and people later, many years later, who were in the same, in the same ward with him told me about it. And um, um, he came home, and he'd been married uh, at 15 or 16, which was probably old for that community where they lived in. We're talking about, you know, rural America. And there was a baby. And when he came home, um, a few weeks after being home, one night, um, the baby cried, for some reason his wife, who had been very careful to wake up, didn't. And she heard a noise, and she heard some sounds, and she went to where the baby was, and Paul was shaking it, because the baby was crying in the middle of the night, shaking it really hard. And I always wonder, and she had to stop him. And we know why, that baby. He, we know what that reminded him of. And maybe that's what she meant, I'm not sure. I don't know, she may have been talking about just that, not the cosmic picture. I just, 
I didn't learn that till later. But you know, the human cost, what we're gonna see in, in Vietnam, in, because in Iraq, the kids coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, what we're gonna see in America, what you're seeing a bit of it here too, is you're gonna see these completely uh, insane people coming back, just insane, because what they're doing and what's happening is indescribable. It's indescribable what goes on, as it does in all wars, but this is a more acute. So we have, and we're not even beginning to look at it, and maybe we will, that's all. That's what we should do. We will, that's what our job is. Okay, goodbye. No more, no more applause, no more, stop. I'm not a trained performer, I'm a fellow journalist.